Uh, don't blame me for that. I didn't, I didn't do that. Uh, all right. Well, let's get right to it, guys. Let's bring out Mr. Mike Judge. So, I find it fascinating that this movie was essentially, it was buried when it came out, right? Like, it basically came and went in the night. I mean, it was just like, there was no promotion or anything. Um, what happened there? Oh, boy. Um, yeah, I was, uh, well, I had, I had completely, you know, my work as a filmmaker or whatever was, had been done. I mean, the last the last time I'd seen this before a little bit of it tonight was uh, the color timing. I think locked picture, final mixed it, and then I didn't hear from anybody for a year. And uh, yeah, no, then it, yeah, it went to I don't know. I don't even know how many theaters, like twelve or something. <laughs> um, yeah, it was it was very weird. Uh, but I, yeah, no, I get asked that a lot, and there's conspiracy theories about it, but. From my end, it was uh, a guy from marketing saying, yeah, you know, we're just going to put it in a few theaters and there's not going to be a trailer. And uh, <laughs> actually, if you wanted to find it, so, so the title on all the contracts was Untitled Mike Judge Project. And somebody <laughs> just put that through and to find it uh, you, on movie phone, you, it was Untitled Mike Judge Project. They didn't even <laughs> bother to put the title in. Did Mr. So, movie Phone say it like that? <laughs> <laughs> it was actually, yeah, it was actually listed in some, on some, you know, with the letters on some marquees I heard is an untitled Mark Judge Project. So, <laughs> yeah, so, it was, uh, yeah, it was sad. <laughs> when did you start to get the sense that it had uh, been reborn? Like, when did you start to uh, catch on that people were uh, coming to it? And um, it's been a slow building thing over the years. Um, I don't know, there were, um, you know, I mean, Oddball, of course, with the Trump thing, and then it's just like Twitter all the time, like idiocracy. Um, yeah, there have been little things, I don't know, um, there's something about a, uh, a coffee place somewhere in Europe that was giving me hand jobs. Um, very specific things. Um, there's the, well then, Carl Jr. is sponsoring everything. We literally almost had a Secretary of Labor who was the CEO of Carl Jr. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I, I, I I either got lucky or I'm some kind of Nostra dumbass. <laughs> yeah, it was specifically Carl Jr. Yeah. No, it was actually Carl's Jr. It's so weird. I mean, that's just, yeah. I do you feel like you created, like, a self-fulfilling prophecy? I mean, I mean the, the first thing that I noticed very early, early on, before anybody, like, you know, even back around the disastrous release, was uh, that, so our, our wardrobe person, so Crocs, nobody had ever heard of them. <laughs> she shows me these things, and it was, I want to say it was like, is making these plastic shoes with these holes and and uh, and I said okay yeah those those look pretty stupid <laughs> I said the only problem is this is a, this is a startup right what if these things are everywhere in the country by the time the movie comes out she said oh no that's never gonna happen <laughs> this is this little company and they, don't worry about it and and from when we shot to when it came out which was about two years uh, everyone was wearing Crocs. <laughs> so things were already headed down. <laughs> but I mean, I mean, this came out, you know, it's so, how do you manage to predict, I mean, you mentioned the Trump thing, uh, the fact that we literally do have a WWE Hall of Famer <laughs> in the office right now. Um, I remember reading last year that you guys were considering putting out some political ads with Terry Crews reprising uh, President Camacho. Uh, but how do you, how do you speak that at this point? Like, yeah, I mean, I think that's why we didn't. It's just sort of like, uh, yeah, it was, it was, 
It was also crazy that, yeah, you can't really spoof it. Um, yeah, I mean, originally when, when I was, I started, I wrote the treatment for the movie in 2001, and then uh, me and um, a guy, Aton Cohen, wrote the first draft of the script, I think it was in 2002, and then I went back, I put it on the shelf, went and rewrote it, but um, I was just sort of thinking of, I mean, I, I drew inspiration from a lot of horrible places, I guess, but uh, one, um, I imagine my junior high, like if my junior high was running the world. <laughs> and uh, we had a guy who, who was actually a very, very charismatic guy. He's a friend of my brother's. He was a student, a student body election for student body president. And uh, this guy, well, I'll just go ahead and say his name, Louis Nogales, because he was a friend of mine. He, or, or my brother's, he, he ran, there was a, all the students coming out doing their usual, uh, you know, I'm going to give the students a voice or whatever. He, he came out with three dudes on either side of him, and uh, he basically quoted Hitler. He came out with <laughs> today in Jefferson Junior High, tomorrow the world is in. And he won by a landslide. <laughs> I voted for him. <laughs> and so I was kind of thinking, like, if my junior high around the world, but then also just kind of like taking everything to its natural conclusion, and then things started to go to their natural conclusion <laughs> in the real world. So, yeah, I, I think I find it fascinating too that you didn't intend originally for this to be a political movie. Like, this was more about a social thing. Like, originally you didn't have a government, right? Yeah, actually, the original, the first draft that I wrote with Aton did not have a president. It was, um, it was a very different, yeah, yeah, I can't even remember, but it, yeah, it didn't have a president. It was sort of an automated thing that was running the country, and, um, and then, I don't know, that's, for movies, it's good to have people. <laughs> so then I, I went back and rewrote it and added the Camacho character and just started to have fun with it. And it was originally, actually, I kind of, originally imagining a different actor and then Terry Crews came in and read for it and just kind of stole the part. He was just so, he was so funny, he had these giant muscles and, and Terry Crews himself is like a really smart, really, like, to, to play dumb, you have to kind of get the joke, I've noticed. Yeah. Like it's, it's hard to, you can't do it without really, it's very rare that you get, although in this movie we have some people who just <laughs> 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 dumb and didn't get the joke, but um, maybe some people with a couple lines here there, but um, yeah, no, Terry just sort of, I, and I sort of reconceived it for him, and, and then added this, you know, this, Pro wrestler, porn star. <laughs> and here we are. Yeah, here we are. Ten years later. Thank you. Yeah, we have the Rock, my friend, the president. Yeah. Um, but what's it? What's really great about Idiocracy, though? I mean, it, one also very depressing <laughs> is that the way, the way it depicts this uh, this sort of slow, insidious coarsening of our culture and just our the way we talk to each other. I was actually walking to my neighborhood the other week and I saw this little kid with a t-shirt that was just like, ask me if I care. And his dad had a shirt that said, get off my dick. <laughs> I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, I'm living in the idiocracy now. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, okay, so, yeah, to that point, I was at, uh, right before, what, what actually, I had this idea for the movie when I was around when I was, or I was working on the Beavis and Butter movie when I got the idea for this. Uh, I didn't do anything with it for a while, but in 2001 I was at Disneyland with my daughters waiting in line at the teacups ride. And this woman with a stroller with a little kid and another, she's holding her other daughter's hand and then another woman comes by and I guess they'd had an altercation and they just start going and they're right behind me. And she just said, look, yeah, say that to my face, bitch. Yeah, bitch. Look, you bitch. Like, just like all this stuff on the word. It's the teacups ride, Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, wow, this is, uh, 
said, okay, this isn't what Disney had in mind. <laughs> <laughs> but that kind of, then I started thinking, wow, this is, maybe I should try to write this. And uh, part of it being, you know, I think I chose Carl's Jr. because they had those, uh, <coughs> don't buy me, I'm eating ads back then. <laughs> they were getting more and more obnoxious, and, you know, Bud Records clearly wanted you to think of butt fuckers. <laughs> And I just thought, like, what if, if eventually they're all just going to give up pretending and it's just going to be flat out, you know, fuck you if you don't smoke our cigarettes, whatever. <laughs> so that was, there was that, and yeah, just kind of taking everything on the path it's already going and seeing where would that go eventually was, was sort of the, that was the concept when I started writing it. I think one of the most influential parts of this movie, weirdly, uh, is the opening sequence, um, it's the sort of, let's, let's just call it soft eugenics happening there at the beginning. <laughs> um, uh, well, yeah, um, it's actually uh, a factor in why my wife and I had kids, actually. Uh, we had this discussion after the Idiocracy came out, because for a long time I was like, no, 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 we can't have kids. And then we got this sort of idea, like, oh, well, what if we were those people? Yeah, yeah I mean, I guess, yeah, I, I wanted to make it so that you could look at it either I mean, I personally think it's a combination of genetics and how you raise a kid, but um, and but I wanted to have it kind of be where you could look at it both ways. So clearly, the you know the redneck guy isn't raising his kids really well, and he's knocking up a bunch of girls and all that stuff. And the people who are careful kind of lose in the you know in the battle of the progeny, I guess. But um, but yes, that was. Uh, that was actually the, the original idea I had. I was just kind of thinking about it, evolution, and there's no predators, and so it's just whoever has the most kids wins. Um, <laughs> and whether it's how you raise them or your genetics, that's, you know, you could look at it either way. But um, that was the original notion. Then it kind of, I thought about just the way things are heading. And just, I, I had also, I'd seen, we were, we were actually just talking about 2001. I had seen that um, around that time and just thought, you know, so that was from what, 1970 or something like that? And 68. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and uh, we got some, some good film buffs, nerds out here. Um, but I thought that would have been kind of cool if, it's, and I love that movie, but I would have, that would have been kind of cool if instead of that pristine future, if it was like, giant Costco's and the Jerry Springer show and stuff. You know, like what if somebody had actually predicted that? That would have been kind of, kind of interesting. And so, I don't know, I was just trying to do something along those lines. I think what's also really interesting about Idiocracy is it predates, uh, you know, social media and Twitter, <coughs> which has really contributed a whole lot to the coarsening of our dialogue, I think. Um, and I also find it interesting that on uh, Silicon Valley, um, the, yes, so come on. Yeah! Woo! Uh, here's another one, and Office Space. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We, have, we have these great minds that are being put in service of creating, of wasting their time, basically, of creating dumb things, and you have it in Idiocracy as well, you have all the brightest minds working on boner pills. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, there's... Yeah, I, I guess, I mean, we, we sort of didn't hit the... Yeah, so, sometimes uh, I wish I could have another chance to do this movie again, because uh, there's a lot of stuff I got wrong, and a lot of stuff that... I mean, I, I don't know, it felt like the movie was cursed to begin with. It was just... Uh, we probably should have... I don't know, it was a, just a whole deal with the studio. They went from really wanting me to make it to really to going, like, why are we making this? <laughs> and. Uh, so there were a lot of battles, and it was just uh, a lot of things that went wrong. But yeah, sometimes I think, you know, um, you know, we have these like these tattoos and all that stuff, and there's probably, you know, there's a lot of stuff I probably got wrong. But uh, that's why I, that's why I didn't watch it tonight. I watched it a little bit again. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little depressing. So, <laughs> just a little. Just a little. It, in the movie, these guys are. The government is run by idiots 
um, and yet they find the smartest man in the world and they decide to hire him to fix all the problems, um, you feel like you were completely naive and optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I remember when it, you know, I, I never did any press because there wasn't much to do. It didn't really come out, but, um, but uh, in, in, I actually think in a weird way the movie was kind of optimistic. I mean, people are still alive and it's 500 years. Uh, did you read the news today? Did you read the Paris Accord thing today? But yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, I didn't want it to be too depressing, but I guess it sort of is. It's a fun kind of question. That's what I do. <laughs> uh, we do want to take some of your questions if you guys want to line up at this uh, microphone here. Um, just one last question for me, and somebody actually kind of shouted it out. I, I know we're not going to make a sequel, uh, but in your head, where do you think these people are now? Where is the world of idiocracy ten years from what we saw? You know, I, we've talked about doing maybe. Um, an animated series, there's actually very recent talks about a musical. Which I actually think could work. I would like another shot at it. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's nice to hear. But do things get better? Oh, probably not. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. That's the answer I was looking for. Everyone will be happy. <laughs> uh, sir, you have a question? Hey, thanks so much for coming, Mike. Um, first off, um, I was curious, I don't know if this was a conscious decision or not, but 500 years in the future, you still have a democracy of some sort maintained. Was that intentional, or was that just for lack of getting a different thing? I, you know, I, I thought about that a lot. Um, I thought myself in circles, and then I just thought, you know, it's just a dumb com comedy. I'm just going to have to feel like that. <laughs> Originally, Camacho, I was sort of thinking of him as sort of a kind of Gaddafi type um, <laughs> ruler, you know, Idi Amin, I was thinking about people like that, and uh, who were probably not officially elected. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, yeah, that's when, when you, you know, the problem with like this, this was such a big concept to make a movie out of it was really kind of challenging, and so I, I Tried to make it as simple as possible, and this, you know, and, and then when I was writing the first draft of Aton, I think he had pitched, you know, the the House of Representing and just that stuff. <laughs> that was, that's, that's pretty funny. So let's just, <laughs> just make it kind of like the, the, our institutions are still there, but they're just really stupid. Thanks, and for the rest of us, please don't ever retire. <laughs> <laughs> In the film, you show the average IQ lowering over time, but by definition, the average IQ is always 100. So I guess my question to you is, is your shit tardy? No. <laughs> I think, well, you're right. You're smarter than most people. <laughs> no, no. Maybe he should be Well, the thing is, no, I, I thought about that. And the thing is, uh, mainstream media talks about their, yeah, the IQ, the whole, Think about it, it's a quotient and 100 is the average. But they talk about it going down and uh, up, and they, they don't talk about it in those terms. I actually went to graduate school in probability and statistics, and the, the thing that no, the media just has given up on any legitimate statistics as far as I can see. So I just figured I'd just play right into it and just show a graph. <laughs> You're part of the problem. You're making it's either I am, I am part of the problem. It's either that or explain how the thing works, and which I probably should have done because no one saw the movie anyway. <laughs> but yes, you're right. My shit is tortured. <laughs> All right, next, next sick burn. You know? <laughs> when not sure, was given his name by the computer. Were you inspired by the Peter Tork? In the monkeys when he was named Nitwit. Oh, was that was that the movie or in the? I, I love the monkeys. I did, what what was it in an episode of the monkeys? I've only shown one clip to my three kids <laughs> of the monkeys, and it's the Nitwit scene when Peter Tork is given that name by a computer. So you, you've never seen that. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Then you can yeah. move it tonight. <laughs> oh, I will. No, I, I, I love the monkeys. Okay. <laughs> yeah. and, and did Sleeper inspire you at all? 
Did what? Sleeper? What oh, do you yeah. Have? Yeah, no, sleeper for sure. I mean, I, I, uh, uh, my mom took me and my brother and sister to see uh, Take the Money and Run. I guess it would have been a second run in the theater when we were kids, and I just really loved it. And, you know, I, I, I love his first, you know, couple decades of movies, and, uh, and uh, I, I, I didn't, yeah, I thought, wow, he just went and made a movie about the future. That's kind of, he's a comedy director who did it. So, I, I, yeah, I definitely thought about that. And, Went and watched it a couple more times. Thank you. Yeah, definitely inspired by Sleeper. <clears throat> Hello. Hello. Hey, Hello. 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 Did you have a question? Yeah, or? I do. Okay. <laughs> I mean, Tulsa's great, don't get me wrong. Anyway, in the opening uh, sequence of King of the Hill, when you have um, everybody standing around the drinking beer. The time lapse thing, yeah. Yeah, they're, just, they're standing around drinking beer and smoking cigarettes about by the trucks. I have a picture of my dad and my uncle is actually doing that. And your humor is just so spot on. How did you come to that? And like, how did you oh. hear to work at it? Well, okay, so I, she's asking about King of the Hill. I, so me and my ex lived in a, we had a house. We bought a house in our 20s in Dallas, in, well, in the, in the suburb of Richardson. And we had a, you, you entered in the alley, and I literally have a picture through our kitchen window of the four guys with their beers. There was a guy who had, uh, he had a pretty small lawn, he had a riding lawnmower and two rototillers. <laughs> <laughs> and they were, yeah, I'll just tell us real quick, like I, I was a musician at the time and my fence had come undone. And so I'm out there just with a hammer. <laughs> like I'll just pound the nail back in and this guy was always out there with his beard, he's looking over at me. And I'm going, oh shit, here he comes. <laughs> he comes over and he goes, yeah, that whole thing's going to have to come out. <laughs> yep, I was just, and then three other guys come over. One guy has a wheelbarrow, one guy has concrete, they're pulling the fence post out. And I'm just kind of standing there. They knock the whole thing out, they start digging a hole. And then finally I went back in and and my wife said, well, what's going on out there? Is that there? I guess they're fixing our fence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the guy, anyway, like I, finally I came out and I, all I had to do was pound some nails and so I go do that and I see him looking at me and he walks over and goes, them's the wrong kind of nails. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, that's, that's really where it started. It's just my, uh, our neighborhood there, I was not one of the four guys. <laughs> that, that happens a lot in your work, right? Your neighbors are like an inspiration for a lot of good people, right? Yeah, yeah, I've gotten a lot of, uh, I mean, a lot of it's real life, yeah, a lot of real life inspiration. Mm -hmm. Ripping off reality is good. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Chantal Mather. Um, another team held question. I love Bobby Hill's soft spot for, but also Pamela Adlon is a delight in whatever she's casting. Um, <laughs> yeah, she's an incredible actor, Pamela Adlon. One question, since I always just have such a soft spot for Bobby Hill. He had a sport, but Hank kept wanting him to find another sport. Bobby's sport was uh, marksmanship. Why did Hank want to keep <laughs> trying to find Bobby's sport? <laughs> yeah, I don't, you know, we went back and forth on that. I mean, it. We were just talking about that recently because uh, Greg Daniels and I had worked on that together and, and it was, uh, it seemed very obvious that Hank would be good with a gun and Bobby wouldn't and we just thought that was a way to turn it on his head. I guess, 
I guess maybe the answer to that question might just be that Fox and everyone was very uncomfortable with guns <laughs> <laughs> being in an animated series. Um, so to have Bobby be just a marksman, gunman <laughs> for the rest of the series might have been really hard to, to push through. But um, yeah, I mean, to your point, like I, Pamela Adlon is such a great actor, like aside from playing a little boy, like, if you've ever seen her in Louie or her new show, which is great, I mean, she's, yeah, she's kind of a, I think one of these days she'll win an Oscar or something, I mean, she's really a great natural actor. Thank you. Thanks. Um, sorry, sorry to be a bad cop, we've got uh, time for two more, okay, I'm sorry about that. So I've been talking with my brother for years about this. The narrator in Idiocracy, he's been telling me, and I don't know how he, he's never met you, that you originally didn't want a narrator because it dumbs down the movie. I was wondering if you could clear that up for the record for me. <laughs> Actually, I, a lot of people said that the narration, having a narrator is sort of a weakness, but I didn't, yeah, you know, at the time I was watching a lot of old, uh, I mean, Stanley Kubrick actually, like a, a lot of his movies, there's narration, right? All the way, I mean, Clockwork Orange, um, I don't know, his first two, I forget the names of them. There's a narrator who's not even a character in the movie. And I was trying to bring that back, I guess. Um, As a villain, we But I, I don't know, I don't, I think. I think it's not, I, I, there are people that say that that means it's bad writing, you have to have somebody say all this stuff and you should be able to do it through the dialogue, but I don't know, I just, a lot of my favorite movies, movies that I think are great movies have narration in them, so I, I don't really, I don't, I mean there are movies where it's like the narration is a sign of weakness, I guess, but uh, hopefully I didn't do that. That narrator was, that was actually Luke's suggestion, I was trying, I wanted a deep, serious voice and and Luke was saying to God, you know, we should get the NFL Films guy. He <laughs> <laughs> talks about a fumble like it's the Holocaust. <laughs> <laughs> Why, that's who that is. That's the NFL Films guy. <laughs> 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 All right, we've got time for one last question. No pressure. None whatsoever, thanks. Um, even though this isn't about me, I'm going to thank you again for the years of amazing efforts and creativity you've given to the world. Woo! Yeah! We all love your work. We wouldn't have dropped into our bank accounts if we didn't love you. But looking at the creative pentameter that you've given to the world, it's not just Americana. It's not just idiocracy. You've run the gamut for well over two decades. You find this inspiration while meeting the common man, an odd dude in a t-shirt, and still <laughs> inspire this sense of, you know what, everybody goes through this. You draw from personal experience, and I have to ask, are you going to give us something new? <laughs> oh, well. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I do, I do, uh, there's like, kind of two or three movie ideas I'm kind of working on, so, uh, I don't know. And these are all actually based on real events that happened, um, one of them to a friend of mine, so I, yeah, um, yeah, no, I do want to, I do want to do a little more while I'm still around, I mean, I look Someone like Clint Eastwood who just kept making great stuff in his old age, and so uh, I have no excuse. So uh, I would like to, I'd like to keep doing it. You are a phenomenal source. Thank you. So thank you. Yeah. All right. I want to give you another round of applause. Thank you so much, my friend.